As known, I'm doing something a bit different this year. In the past, I've always kind of done like a state of sports technology, um, which was fun. But this year, I decided to change up a bit. And so, uh, you know, I think your your agenda says I'm doing something, and I'm going to change it up and do something else. So, um, <laughs> but it's it's in line with what the agenda says. Uh, so, what I want to do actually is to take the kind of spirit of what the agenda says and apply it to launching a product, which I think is ultimately what you are all attempting to do on a regular basis is to launch products. Um, and so this is focused on launching a sports technology product, but I think you'll find that in a lot of ways it carries over to pretty much anything you try to launch uh, from a product standpoint. So I'm gonna start with an email that I received last week um, from a, a company that I wrote a post about last week. Uh, and they, the, it was a very, very long, very, very angry email. Um, but basically it got summed up in these two, these two lines here that they said I killed their business and uh, I might as well, they might as well go ahead and shut down uh, their entire business. Uh, so, you know, it's ironic because I thought it was actually quite a nice post, but apparently it wasn't. Um, so, the purpose of this is to kind of tell you how not to get in that situation. Um, and, you know, I think the, you know, the one line version is just launch a good product. If you launch a good product, then generally speaking, you won't get in the situation. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to get to the launching part uh, that can make your life easier. Um, so, the first piece is to kind of understand where I fit in. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, different media groups and then where I fit into a media group. Um, so, you know, Paul, the PR person that was just here a moment ago, would, would label me as an influencer, right? Someone who uh, can influence a lot of different things. Um, you know, every media outlet, magazine, publication follows me on, on Twitter, on what I write. It um, doesn't matter if it's the New York Times or the BBC, they're following what I say. Um, now, they won't necessarily talk about me, right? But they'll, they'll follow what I say and, and basically follow those trends. Um, in the same way that every retailer and buyer distributor does the same thing. Um, so again, I'm influencing those, uh, but if you go to REI's site, they won't say DC Rainmaker somewhere. But behind the scenes, REI prints off all my reviews and decides based on that and my product recommendations as to what they'll carry, right? And that's just a simple example of something that influencers may not be totally visible um, you know, in front of things, but behind the scenes, they're making, making stuff happen. Um, most importantly is that all the PR stuff that you guys just got told there, um, I don't tend to follow that script very well. So I usually throw that script out and kind of go by, beat by my own drum there. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind, um, but that doesn't mean those points aren't valid. In fact, I would argue with really nothing that, that Paul said. I think he had a lot of great points and a lot of great ways to approach the media. Um, and you'll see how I've kind of taken what he's talked about and twisted into how to approach me and to pro approach other sports technology um, and sports folks in our industry. Last but not least, who I actually write for is consumers. It's everyday people. Um, I'm not writing for you in this room. I'm not writing for the BBC or someone else to follow me, and I'm not writing for REI or someone else to read my content and decide what to, to carry. I'm writing for consumers, and I'm in particular writing for really basically like uh, seven people, roughly. Um, now, it sounds silly. These are all real-life people um, that have no idea. I've just put their name up on the screen. Uh, but these are people that are in my real-life friends and family. Um, and this is who I'm writing about when I'm writing a product. I'm looking at these names and seeing how does something fit into one of these categories. You know, Phil is a, a friend of mine. He was in Paris this past summer. We did the Paris Triathlon together. Um, very competitive cyclist. And so, you know, when I was putting together my Edge 520 post, I was thinking about how would he use that product? Um, not necessarily about how um, Lauren, his wife, would use the product. Um, she's a different, a different person. She's still a triathlete. Um, she's still a middle of pack runner, uh, but she's not likely to use a lot of the features like Strava and things like that on the Edge 520. Instead, she just wants to go out and ride. And the same with Mark. Mark is very much like Phil, but more of a commuter um, cyclist and not someone who's really going to do a lot of races. Um, and his wife, Mayan, um, is not going to do any races at all. She's not going to be out there running you know, a, a 10K race or anything. Um, she's just being healthy. And so if I'm looking at a product that's a wrist-based wearable, how am I appealing to what she, she's interested in? Um, and you know, I can go down the list, my mom, my dad, um, the girl, my wife, each of those people, I'm, I'm writing towards the different segments. Uh, so that's something that, you know, I'm not looking at just the pure performance athlete like we talked about this morning. Instead, I'm looking at who is that product for. Uh, so if I review a $100 GPS watch, it's very different than a four or $500 GPS watch. So it's probably a bit small from way back there, but um, you know, you gotta understand the, the media landscape before you can understand that blogging landscape or whatever you want to call it. Um, at the top, you know, you have traditional mainstream media, things like the New York Times, BBC, ESPN, CBS, all that jazz. Um, then you've got 
mainstream sport magazine, so Runner's World, Bicycling, Triathlete, uh, Men's Health, stuff like that. Uh, and then you have tech media, Verge and Gadget, TechCrunch, Wired, uh, and so on. There's, there's plenty in that category. Um, and then you have blogs. Now, in a lot of ways, tech media, they're all technically blogs. They all have RSS feeds and all that jazz, but you know, we kind of put them in a different category um, than blogs. And blogs would be me, um, but it's also you know, cycling tips, bike radar, Velo News, um, the companies and organizations that actually cover your segment, um, whether you want to call them a blog or a sports technology publication or just a sports publication that you now have as a, a blog, doesn't really matter, but it's in that, that category. And then below there you have um, kind of the non-written social media. And by that I mean that it could be pictures, it could be YouTube videos, it could be you know, things on Facebook. Um, and those are, that's a very important and growing group of people. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about what those people do and how that might influence your product plans. In order to engage each of those groups, you have to know what they actually care about. You have to know essentially how they make money um, because that's what all those groups really care about. They care about money or they care about some sort of um, recognition, right? So if you start off at the top, mainstream media, they're caring about views, viewership, and subscriptions. Um, so an interesting story to them isn't because the story is interesting, it's because they want to get viewership, right? In the same way that mainstream magazines um, online is views in paper subscriptions, um, but it's also it's paid ads. That's basically what they're after, is how do they get paid ads for magazines? Because that's what drives, uh, what drives their profitability. Um, the actual subscription piece and, and online ads isn't, isn't really that much in the grand scheme of things. And tech media, um, it's views. It's all about views. It's all about number of views that a site gets so that they can get more advertising impressions. That's the, the key thing there. Um, you're seeing more and more limited paid content with some of these big sites that have experimented with it over the last, uh, say, six to 12 months. Um, so that's something that is changing a little bit there, uh, but it's primarily views. So they want stories, they want lots of stories so they can go ahead and carry that through. Then you get into blogs, and this is where it gets really tricky. Um, so Blogs want views, but by and large, the, the numbers when you, you know, go through like advertising rates and things like that, for most blogs, doesn't work out. It's not terribly profitable. Um, instead, they have to supplement that income some other way. Um, so if you look at a lifestyle blogger, and I'll talk about that in a second, what that is, that's about paid content. That's about paid sponsorship um, or a paid post in some way, shape, or form um, versus Another publication that may be about sponsoring the entire site for a period of time, like Slow Twitch, for example, in the triathlete um, world. You know, you can go and you can pay to sponsor Slow Twitch as a site for a period of time, and everything is all about your product for that period of time. Um, so they're not paying on a per advertising basis anymore. They're paying on sponsoring the entire site um, because it's again doing impressions doesn't really work out for most people when you're talking low volumes. Um, if you have 500,000 views a month, you can't make money on impressions. It's just, you know, people always say, well, just advertising on the side of the, on the, side of the post or whatever. There's not much money in advertising. So what are lifestyle blogs? And this is what's probably interesting to you. Um, you know, these used to be called mommy blogs, um, and that's probably the term that most people are familiar with. Um, but as you'll find out, it's far from just mommies anymore. Um, it's all sort of people, uh, and it's basically folks that are recounting their lives and you can potentially pay to enter that that view um, you know if I were when I started out I'd be technically categorized as a lifestyle blogger right that was something I talked about what I ran and um, or what I ate and where I ran all that jazz and nothing nothing product wise it was just simply here's what I did this weekend now though it's all about sponsor content within that uh, so now it's about sponsor posts and pre-written posts and YouTube videos um, like if you go into YouTube there's no YouTube star out there today, none, not a single one, that makes their money on advertising dollars. Every single one of them, even the ones that have 3 million or 5 million followers, are doing it based on sponsored engagements. They're doing it based because a company has sponsored them to say a message. Um, and that's, you, again, you can't make money on YouTube just on views. You have to have something behind the scenes. And so if you're looking at talking to people in that world of, kind of social media, um, they're basically looking for a check. They're looking to talk about your product for a check, uh, which is a little bit different than a sponsorship, which we'll talk about in a second. The key to figuring out if something is sponsored media in the lifestyle world is a hashtag. Um, that's like the dead giveaway because most of those folks are asked to put hashtags on something, um, or sometimes they'll ask to put, you know, this is a, I was, uh, the product is paid for, but um, the opinions are my own, right? And the opinions are my own piece is the dead giveaway because it's really impossible for someone to write this product completely and totally sucks when someone just paid 
you know, $1,000 for that post behind the scenes. Um, and that's, that's a cheap going rate, by the way. If you look at what blogs cost for viewership, and there are sites out there that do that, you know, $800 to $1,000, doesn't buy you much in the visibility sphere. Um, you know, so like for a, a blog my size, if I was to charge per post, be tens of thousands of dollars um, to get that sort of visibility, right? So that's the thing to keep in mind versus that's why when people talk about what are mommy blogs, it's that you're going further down the, the spectrum, you're paying a smaller amount, um, but you're trying to go grassroots instead. Paid trips are most common for lifestyle blogs. And I'll talk about that a moment as well when I give examples. Um, so I'm gonna give examples of product launches um, and kind of walk the, through those, should be a little bit fun. Uh, and then last but not least, return of investment for this sort of thing tends to be better than a pro athlete. Uh, and the reason is that you're getting down to people that other readers can relate to, right? So, you know, they're following someone online and they're following their every moment in life and they're gonna relate to that person better than a pro athlete. But there are still many reasons you might want to sponsor an athlete. The first that you've got to decide is whether you want to sponsor someone that's a professional or an age grouper. Two different use cases. Um, you know, and, and sometimes that's called sponsored or ambassador. Ambassador is now the new term for sponsored because sponsored sounds like you're being paid out. Um, so basically they're called ambassadors now. Uh, but the, the concept is the same. You're potentially paying someone in kind of one of two buckets. Either A, you're paying them to uh, use their product by giving them free product. Um, or B, you're paying them cash based on results. So if you go to a pro athlete, they're likely gonna want cash based on results and some sort of sponsorship agreement. If you go to a um, age grouper, they're gonna want basically free product and maybe a discount for friends and families and things like that. Um, when you're looking at sponsorships, you need to decide what you want to get out of it. Is it product validation? Is it marketing? Is it trying to get the word out? Um, if it's product validation, then a pro athlete is the best way to go because they're going to be at a, you know, you can put on your marketing later on, X athlete uses our product and he went, or he or she went to the podium and whatnot, right? That's product validation and it worked just fine. So if you look at SRAM with um, their ETAP system, right? All of their efforts there are primarily product validation efforts. It's to be able to say that when they went to launch that this product has worked. It worked in the Tour de France. It worked for this World Championship Series. It worked for this and that. That's all about product validation um, versus having that athlete stand up and say, I used X product or Y product. Um, that's much more difficult to get something out of. That's, that's an arrangement that rarely works. I mean, just think about it. You've gone to a local race um, and you've competed and maybe you end up on the podium, maybe you didn't. But when you looked up at the podium and you saw your local age group athlete there or local semi-pro or even pro athlete, did you actually look at their jersey and look and see what their sponsorships were on the back of their jersey? No, there's a gazillion little ads there and you don't, you don't care at all. Um, so you've got to decide what your goal is in sponsoring something um, or sponsoring an athlete. So look at sports technology media. Uh, it's funny, there's really only like 20 to, or 10 to 20 different sports technology outlets out there um, or the outlets that would cover sports technology um, in the sporting world, right? So sure, you'll get Engadget or the occasional uh, New York Times that will cover a product in this world, um, but by and large, you won't. Most of the people in this room, you're focused on uh, bicycling or running world or things like that or the online equivalencies. Um, so when it comes to getting you know, press with one of us, um, the easiest way, by and large, or far and away, is demos. I mean, demos, demos, demos. That's where, you know, if I look at all of the, the majority of the posts that I do, it's because I've used a product um, and used it in person. And if you look at the majority of coverage from, you know, Bike Radar to Velo News to Running Magazine and all the different groups, it's because they've used the product. And there's really three ways you can go about that. One is that, you know, you're coming to me or you're going to um, a media outlet's office and you're running through the product there. You're showing them that your product actually does work. Um, two, you could have me go to your headquarters um, and you know, it's valuable as well because I can see how your operation works and see how our company works. And as Paul talked about earlier, trying to establish a storyline there. And so that's something that, you know, I can talk to what your company is doing. And you tend to have a lot more, um, a lot more people on staff that can talk to different topic areas. Uh, so that's really valuable. Um, and then three, there's going offsite somewhere else, which is very, very popular as well. So that's something where, you know, you're taking a group of journalists and you're going to an offsite location for uh, one to three days typically, uh, and you're running through the product. Uh, the challenge with that, of course, is that, you know, you have to arrange that entire 
event, um, and it tends to be a bit of a, a bit of a tricky thing to do. Um, when you look at kind of the, the cadence of how those events work, uh, you know, typically there's PowerPoint briefs up front for the morning, and then you go out for a ride or a run, and then later in the day you you download that data and look at and analyze it, and this is where the company tells you how the data should or shouldn't look, um, and whether it did or didn't work, uh, and then you know you have dinner or whatnot, and potentially repeat the entire process the next day. Um, from my standpoint, I tend to prefer either people just coming straight to me um, because that's easier on a time standpoint. Um, or you know, going somewhere and riding with a product. I don't particularly care where that is, but I want to be able to run, ride, swim, whatever it may be, with the product to be able to be able to show it's good. And I think that's actually true across almost all of my peers. I don't think there's uh, many of the people that write about your products that don't want to test it first. Um, I think so. It's really something you need to keep in mind. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give some examples because case studies are way more fun um, than talking about nebulous things. So I've got basically three and a half categories of well-executed product launches. Um, basically, a good, bad, and then middle ground, and a hail mary. Right? The here's what a hail mary looks like, and why you should or shouldn't potentially do it. Um, but of course, you got to understand what is the purpose of a product launch, and it's you know one to increase awareness of a product. Um, you're trying to ensure that there's no misinformation, yes, but also no missing information. Um, if consumers get tiny tidbits of information about a product and they can't find the details they want, then a lot of times they won't actually buy that product. They'll just simply move on and forget about it. Um, and it's to go ahead and get them to execute on that decision. You want to get them to actually buy something. That's your goal. Um, now, it may not be your something that they buy, but maybe they decide after you've launched the product that it's not the right product for them, and they're going to buy something else. Um, but your goal as a company should be to get them to buy something, uh, and thus eventually ship something, hopefully shortly thereafter or not a year or two later. Uh, so you know, a good product launch will make it easy for a customer or easy for your consumer to check off all those three to five things up top there. Um, a bad product launch will will make that make that tricky. Um, so just one thing to keep in mind before I go through this: um, remember that you know I'm I'm giving these in the spirit of learning. Uh, so is this my favorite like poster from Despair.com? Uh, I've actually bought the poster. Uh, it simply says mistakes. It could be that the uh, purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others, right? So. <laughs> Think about this in product launches, right? The, the purpose of what I'm about to show you is to, to explain how to and to not to launch a product. So we'll start off with the good ones first. Um, and now I'm talking about good product launches in the sense of how they've worked with me or how they work with other journalists. In a lot of cases, they work with me the same as other journalists. Um, so you know, I'll give this example here first of the Wahoo Element. It's a bike computer that was announced at Interbike about two weeks ago. Um, now, when the, the company first, Wahoo Fitness, first talked about the Element, it was over a year ago they talked to me about it. Um, and at that point, I was able to give them some, some thoughts on where the product was going, the direction, uh, and you know, kind of some suggestions. They were free to follow them or not follow them and they followed some and they didn't follow others and that's fine. Um, but it gives them that chance to get that feedback. Uh, the same is true of most other journalists in the sports technology world. If you talk to the guys from Bike Radar or Velo News or Global Cycling Network, all those guys are talking to companies a year plus for products. Um, so, and given initial feedback, uh, they may not go for a ride with it, they may just simply sit down at a trade show and, and show how something works. That's very, very common. Um, I then met them at Eurobike, so that's two weeks before Interbike, and we did a couple rides there with the product where I had it and I could use it as I saw fit. Um, and then they took the product with them, and they didn't, I wasn't able to have it then for another two weeks. Uh, and then two days before Interbike, we met again, and they gave me a prototype that I could use and do my final photographs on, um, as well as go ahead and prepare my post on. Uh, so in this case, it was an in-depth review, obviously, because it's not something I had a lot of time with. It's just a first look. It's just a, here's how this product roughly works, um, and then you know what, what a customer might think about it. Probably the most interesting thing here, um, well, actually, for one, one quick mention, I technically had a launch exclusive, um, but actually for me, I don't particularly like launch exclusives. Um, I don't know, I guess I, for me, I don't want to be on the other side of that equation where someone else has a exclusive. Um, I also think exclusives from your standpoint hurt you more than they help you. Um, so if you promise a reporter that you can have an exclusive to announce on Tuesday, and then the rest of the world is on Wednesday, um, the internet doesn't work like that, right? As I'll explain to you in a minute, the internet is global and it works on the same time thing where basically when you announce something on Tuesday, the rest of the world gets it on Tuesday. So if you go to Wednesday, a reporter won't bother to cover you anymore because that was yesterday's news, right? So exclusives, 
to me, are a waste of your time. Um, I'm happy they decided to give me an exclusive chance to play with the product, but it doesn't impact my reviews, and honestly, I'm not a big fan of it. Probably the biggest thing Wahoo did correctly, though, is they assigned someone on their team to follow up to every single comment that was written on my post. So every single comment, someone followed up and said, yes, no, this is working, this is not working. Um, and that, if, if you watched, if you go look at those comments over the course of a few days, people are so excited about the fact that the company was actually responding to the requests. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to respond on my site, but you can respond on many other sites out there. It's not hard to really cover the sports technology world um, and assign someone to go ahead and respond to consumers. Uh, it shows you're engaged, it shows you're interested. Next, we got the PowerTap P1s. Um, you'll see a very similar trend to what Wahoo did. In this case, uh, I saw the product well over a year ago now, um, and they you know, provide some initial feedback on what things did and didn't work. Um, they had a private event in, attached to a, a Tri Expo um, in Germany uh, back last, I think, February, roughly. And then there was like a two-week embargo on it. Um, and that's when they went to the US and did the same thing for US media outlets. Uh, and then we all had a, a launch date on a, a given date two weeks in advance. advance. Uh, generally speaking, I prefer embargoes being out a few days. I hate if I go to an event and I have to, like it launches the same day. That means I can't write really anything very, very good. Um, at the same time, if an event is too big, then there's going to be leaks in the number of journalists there. Um, so you want a smaller event. Uh, and this sort of thing within the power meter world is very common. You know, Garmin did it with Vector, um, brought, I think, about eight or 10 of us to the Vector launch and uh, went to somewhere in Colorado. And we spent two days riding it um, and got to ask questions. And then the launch was, I believe, about a week later. Um, so that gave us time to analyze data, gave us time to get photographs edited and text written and all that kind of stuff. Um, that works very well as a small group of people as opposed to being a big group of 50 or 60 journalists. Uh, they then had two separate ride camps, one in the US and one in Germany, uh, later in March, I think it was, in April, roughly. Um, and that's where the chance we finally got to be actually on the bike with it. Uh, so in their case, they split that event. A lot, of, a lot of companies will actually combine those together where you know, it's all in one shot, but they're timeline-wise, they just didn't have that number of units available. Um, but that was fine. So then I went there and was able to ride with it and try things out for uh, two days. And then finally, they shipped me a unit ahead of retail availability, um, about two weeks ahead of when they started shipping roughly, which meant that uh, about a month later, I was able to go ahead and put a review out. Um, versus if you ship me something after availability, then it takes me longer to get to a review. Um, and also, you know, like I talked about earlier, my goal is to be there when that product announces. Um, so if you send something to me even a day after product announcement, I've missed that window. Um, so that on my totem pole of things that are important to deal with next, that goes further down that window because, or down that totem pole, because I'm no longer, it's no longer news. It's something that's old. So let's talk about some middle ground. Um, now I'm not picking on Garmin here because uh, there's actually cases where I can give you Garmin products across the entire spectrum of great product launches to not so great product launches, right? So great product launches, um, I would say the Phoenix 3, um, the Vivo Active, those are products that I had in advance quite a bit. I was able to work with them. Um, a, lot of, a lot of early in touch with those products, so that's a, a very well executed product launch. Um, and then there's other product launches uh, like the Edge Explorer, right? Just came out a couple weeks ago that I didn't have until after the product was launched. So in that case, you know, my, my timing for a post, if I've missed that 7 a.m. Eastern uh, time that Garmin always times our posts till, um, then I've missed it. Like, and I'm, um, I'll kept doing it when I get to it. It was Eurobike week, so I got to it a day later. It's the way it works. The Edge 520 is in the middle ground, so it kind of shows you the, the realm of potential, what I, can, what I can deliver, but it also shows you that um, what's left on the table. So I knew about the units of the grapevine uh, about a couple months in advance, roughly. Um, I got the PR materials 36 hours before launch. Uh, I got a test unit 24 hours before launch. And then um, I had that 24 hours to take as many pictures as I could and use the unit a little bit there. Uh, so I went for a couple rides, but not a ton. Um, and then at the end of the 24 hours, I gave it back, and that was, that was it. Um, so you know, that was a very finite period, um, and it was lucky that that I happen to be in town those days, um, but if it wasn't, then it wouldn't have worked out, and therefore I wouldn't have potentially had a, a post for that launch, um, and obviously that's a, a fairly big product for, for Garmin, and a fairly big product, for, I think, for the industry, a lot of people look at that product. So, you know, there's this case it worked out, but, you know, you're kind of cutting it close, and you also cut into the quality of what the journalist could potentially deliver. Um, so not everyone is going to turn around a 24-hour notice on a, on a piece, including photos and all that stuff. Um, they might just simply say, hmm, we'll get to it next time. 
Same in the middle ground is also the TomTom Tom Spark. So this unit launched on September 3rd, uh, 2015. Uh, so about three, four weeks ago now. Uh, and it launched at the IFA event, uh, I think it's in Berlin. Um, so there was no prior notice to any media, um, not just me, but anybody at all. They literally launched it and then sent the PR at the exact same time and said, good luck. Uh, and everyone's kind of standing around going, hmm, okay. Um, so what happens then is that it gets to the bottom of the, the pile, right? Because people are busy with other things. Uh, and so there was no hands-on time. People had some booth time that they saw with the product uh, that week while I was there, but you're not going to get much media attention because there was nothing that was preceded ahead of time. So how they've recovered from that, which by the way, if you had just left the story there, that would have been a dismal launch, right? That would have been a, you didn't precede anything with anyone, you just announced a product and didn't really answer a lot of questions about how the product worked. Um, so they recovered a little bit. So they passed week um, in Ibiza. It's a nice, warm, beachy destination in the Mediterranean. Um, they brought in uh, 60 journalists slash lifestyle bloggers slash peoples uh, and basically had them for three days to go ahead and do um, use the product and get the word out. Um, now, some of those were major journalists from magazines, you know, like Women's Health and things like that. Um, and others were more Instagram, you know, YouTube people like that, that would have no written presence in terms of a, a blog, but would have a large YouTube following, you know, 100,000 people on YouTube or Instagram or things like that. Um, so that's, that's kind of focusing on a very different spectrum. Um, and that's, you know, trying to get that viral grassroots sort of style out. Uh, in this case, that's an all expense paid thing um, that costs them a lot of money. Uh, it's not a cheap place to be uh, and to fly people from all around the world. 60 people is definitely expensive. Um, now, in their case, they decided that I didn't want to go to the beach, apparently. Um, so I went to rainy London for the day uh, and <laughs> went to their, their headquarters um, on my own dime and, and met with their, their team there, the fitness team, uh, and you know, got to use the product and, and then take the product home with me. Um, now, obviously, I have a product now, and I wrote a post about it the next day, kind of my first run impressions with it. Um, but at the same time, they left three weeks on the table. Right? I didn't write about that product for three weeks because I don't typically write about products unless I've had my hands on them. Uh, so people ask questions, and my stock answer in their case was they're using a new optical sensor. I can't trust that optical sensor. Um, they've added Bluetooth headphone capability. We've seen other companies add Bluetooth headphone capability with limited success in running watches. Uh, so therefore, I can't testify whether that's a good or bad product, but you'll have to wait and see, which effectively stalls shipments and interest in their product for them. So, not so ideal launches. Um, now, last year I gave Suunto a hard time, so I don't want to, I'm not picking on Suunto two years in a row. Um, it just sort of happened that way. Uh, last year I gave Suunto a hard time because their AMP Plus, or sorry, the Bluetooth Smart Compatibility um, was dismal. Uh, and to Suunto's credit, uh, in the two months following that event, um, they have made everything and anything compatible with the Ambit 3 um, they could find. They have done a superb job of going out there and basically running down issues with compatibility um, and fixing them as soon as they hear about them. Um, so I give them all the credit in the world there. Unfortunately, when it comes to product launches, uh, not so smooth. Um, so there is something called the Suunto Traverse. You've probably never heard of it. Um, it's actually a GPS watch. Uh, it sort of announced this summer. Um, so it was seen on a show floor in Spain the last week of July, uh, just out there like on your typical booth displays. And a random person on YouTube decided to make a video on it um, and publish the video out. Just not a media outlet, just somebody that was just strolling through the floor and saw this and made a video, kind of a hands-on walkthrough video of it. And that was it. And that was the sum total of that product launch. Um, and then I got nothing back. And I'm like, that's weird. What is this? What's this product? Uh, and a week later, it was outdoor retailer as well. Um, again, no formal product launch. Just simply, it's there. Go check it out. Um, so it's funny that this morning, I kid you not, this morning, um, I got an email from Suunto announcing the Suunto Traverse. Um, now, it's been at every single trade show since late July. Um, today, they are announcing it. People have been asking about it, what it is now for six months, or not six months, six weeks. Um, and now they have a website for it, but you still can't buy it. You can't buy it for another two weeks. Uh, just to, in general, when you get someone's attention, you want them to execute on the action. You want them to be able to buy something. If they hear about a product today, let's just pretend they launched today, and they can't buy it for another two weeks, they're likely to forget about that product. 
So you want to get those two dates as close as possible between the point when they hear about it and when they can click the purchase button so that you have the credit card information. If that is a large gap, then people lose interest and they forget about you. So as a result of this launch, there's been no PR. There's nothing covered in any media outlet on it. Um, there's no attention anywhere, um, nothing. And the irony was I would have actually covered the device if they had simply told me about the device um, at the time frame and, and I had some hands-on time, I would have covered it. Um, it's not a device that I think is spectacular based on specs, but it's certainly relevant to my space and I think it's relevant to the larger you know, sports technology world. Um, so again, lessons learned here is that you want to kind of make sure that things are tied together. It shouldn't be a, an accident that someone finds your product um, out there. So remember I mentioned the half a category. So the half a category is the Hail Mary, right? This is the, we're just going to throw it out there and hope this works out. Um, the Hail Mary goes to the folks to my left here, um, four eyes. <laughs> with the precision power meter. Um, and in their case, the Hail Mary worked out. Uh, so what it was is that last year at Eurobike, they briefed me on their power meter they were launching. Uh, and you know, I was shown the, the product. It's, at the time, it wasn't even on a crank arm. It was a little football looking thing that was just kind of handled around. Um, and then we met the night before Interbike um, in a hotel room, like the Springfield Suites or something. Um, like this whole story sounds like a drug deal, basically. Uh, so <laughs> night, the night before, at like 10 o'clock, um, and we used a bunch of glues that you could potentially sniff, but we weren't sniffing, um, to attach this to the crank arm and got it installed. And the next morning at 6 a.m., we met uh, in the middle of the desert um, next to a lake, and too many vans rolled up. Um, and I went for a ride, right? And that was, that was it. That was the Hail Mary of if this product worked on the ride, that would likely you know, propel um, this product in a very successful direction. Um, if this product failed on the ride, then that would probably be a very bad thing um, for a product launch. Uh, and in their case, it worked. It, you know, it, it worked out great for that one ride. And I, I caveated it a million times that this is just one ride. And sometimes things go well, and sometimes things don't. Um, but they lucked out. That same day, um, earlier in the day, I met with Brim Brothers uh, and their power meter doing precisely this same routine, uh, minus the 10 p.m. in a hotel room part. And it didn't work, right? In their case, uh, the power meter had a lot of problems on my one ride that I had with it. Um, and that Hail Mary ended up having them cancel uh, their product uh, release plans. So it goes both ways. You know, you can, you can go in this direction and hope it works out, or or not. It just depends on how, how confident in your product you are. So that's a nice segue into sport trade shows. Um, the things to understand about sport trade shows for me is that if I'm surprised at a trade show about your product, you failed. Failed really, really bad. Um, I should never stumble into your booth and find something that I haven't heard about in the weeks beforehand. Um, as a company, you shouldn't be assuming that someone's going to walk by your booth and find something. You should have sent them that material well ahead of time so I can walk in and go, OK, I need to take care of something. Um, at the same time, almost all of the posts that I write now for Interbike and Eurobike and all these different trade shows I go to are done ahead of time. Um, I meet with companies the weekend beforehand or weeks beforehand, and I get those products ready to go so that on announcement day at the trade show, I'm not coming visiting your booth other than maybe say hi. Um, I'm just the post goes up automatically. Uh, so it's really important to understand is that if you're talking between main big companies and mainstream media, all of that happens beforehand. Um, for me, trade shows are about catching up with smaller companies or small announcements that I couldn't otherwise cover somewhere else. Uh, they're not about getting the big announcements. Those should be done well in advance. Uh, and if you go to CES, you know, talked about CES in the last um, presentation there, almost all of those meetings are happening off the show floor. All the really important ones. The important ones with the journalists that you really want are somewhere else. Uh, in your group, they would be in Red Rock Canyon, or they'd be at the track, or they'd be somewhere else around town. Um, they're not happening on the show floor. Uh, and I think probably the most important thing is to understand, you know, your, your goal in these trade shows is really about ancillary media. Um, it's about the smaller publications that, you know, you can't handhold all the time with and getting their attention. Um, the big ones, again, you should have already done that beforehand. So uh, like Paul mentioned before, um, who are your target platforms? Understand that. Uh, understand you know, who you're trying to reach. Are you trying to reach mainstream media, uh, things like the New York Times or Men's Health? And is that really realistic anyways? Uh, and, and what's your goal there? Um, or are you trying to reach sport-specific 
publications, the uh, bicycling, runner's world, et cetera, um, or are you trying to reach kind of that uh, homegrown lifestyle magazine, or not magazine, lifestyle blogs uh, realm. Probably the most important thing though is to remember that you are not Apple. Um, I hear this all the time. You know, it's Apple has billions of dollars they can spend on, on the entire process of a launch, right? Um, their launch events themselves are millions and millions of dollars. Uh, so you can't duplicate that process. And you shouldn't also expect the same level of coverage, right? And Engadget, Engadget or Gizmodo or TechCrunch is going to have 28 different posts about the Gadget Eye device that was released that day. Um, you're not going to get 28 posts about your device, if even one, right? So you've got to figure out um, how does that how does that fit into your your publication plans? So here's some really simple launch day checklist stuff. Um, these are things that I know are important to me because the consumers ask me these same questions. Um, when does your website go live? Right? It's not acceptable for your website to not have information about your product that you just announced the day that you announced it. Right? If you if your information is missing, that's that's a fail. That means that a consumer that wanted to buy something can't do that, right? So taking Garmin, for example, they always announce at 7 a.m. Um, Eastern time. And I can guarantee you at 7 a.m. I can go to their site and see information about that product launch. Um, if I can't, then how else is the consumer getting information about it? Um, can they actually click to purchase your product at 7 a.m. or 7.01 a.m.? Yes or no? If they can't, why not? Um, is it because you don't trust in the product enough yet to sell it? then should you be announcing, right? That, that probably tells the consumer, if you can't buy it, then maybe that product's not ready for prime time yet. Um, have you provided PR material, specs, details, all that jazz to journalists? Uh, like for me personally, I won't use any of your PR quotes and all the pictures and all that stuff is kind of garbage to me, but I will use the spec sheets and the materials to validate what I'm saying, to make sure I haven't screwed up anywhere. Um, I'm not gonna quote it, but I'm gonna go ahead and use it to make sure I haven't screwed up somewhere else. Are your retailers ready to sell your products and have their SKUs loaded? Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies are afraid of giving retailers sort of the advance notice of products out there um, because of leaks and things like that. The vast majority of leaks don't come from retailers. Um, they just don't, in, in our segment anyways. One, nobody actually cares about our segment. Um, so, you know, they just, people care about the Apple Watch, but not, not uh, not a new GPS watch. It's just the reality of that. Um, and if we look at the history of leaks um, in our segment, let's take Garmin, for example. Um, Garmin notifies all, the, not all, but a lot of the retailers and distributors well ahead of time of products. But their leaks over the last year, every single one of them, were a self-inflicted wound, right? It was something that a website automatically published a month in advance or a week in advance accidentally. Um, it wasn't that retailer, distributor, or someone else that did that. And it wasn't a PR person either, and it wasn't a journalist somewhere else. Um, so don't be afraid of embargoes and timelines. That's, that's the way the world works, and that's how you get good coverage uh, ahead of time. What's your global distribution plan? Um, you need to have an answer on that in this day and age. You know, people read your stuff around the world, um, and like Pioneer, for example, they launch power meters um, in Japan first, and then in Europe, and then in the US, with like four months gaps between each one. Um, and consumers don't think that way. Like I, you know, as a company, you try to, you may try to focus on different regions, but you need to have a really crisp answer when you launch and say, we are launching here, there, and then on X, Y, and Z date. Um, you can't simply say we are launching in Japan today and we'll pretend nobody else exists. Um, it just doesn't work. It's not the way the internet works anymore. So you need to have an exact plan for how to deal with that. The Kickstarter projects. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot of interest in using Kickstarter. I'm not a big fan of doing that for established companies. I think that's, uh, that kind of basically says that um, you're asking for PR. Um, if you're a new company, that's all right. Uh, just keep in mind that you know, the trust level of Kickstarter and related crowdfunding sites has plummeted quite a bit. Um, so people trust you know, Kickstarter at X level, that's fairly low. But even like sites like Indiegogo is even lower uh, because the entry bars are you know, lower to get into. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're choosing platforms as to which one you might choose. Um, the Kickstarter sweet spot, if you're going to launch a product, is three to four months out. Uh, if you're launching a product, you can say it'll be available, for example, if I launched it today, be available at roughly Christmas or early January. That's a sweet spot. That's a believable timeline. That's something I can look at and go, so they're basically at production. They need the money to get through production. Um, versus if you tell me you're coming out next spring, then I'm looking at that going, nope, they're full of it. Um, because that means they haven't got to the point of 
uh, prototypes and that piece where they're going to find out all those bugs yet. And of course, every Kickstarter project underestimates what that, that time frame will take. Um, and last but not least, important, uh, just you know, for people in this room, but anybody else you may watch later on on YouTube, I do not write about Kickstarter projects unless I've had a product in hand. It's that simple. Um, and the same is true of almost any other product out there, that 99% of the time, I will not write about a product unless I'm able to physically touch it. It doesn't have to work, though. It doesn't have to work like really well. It just has to, I have to be able to judge how far along that process are they. Are they one month away, six months away, a year away? Um, and that's why I have that requirement to physically touch something. Uh, it can be a 3D printer prototype. It can be anything you want. Um, you know, and that's something as well that a lot of companies are really afraid of having media take photos of a, a 3D printed or non final unit. Um, consumers don't care. As long as it roughly looks like what the unit's going to look like, they're happy to see that versus a mocked up stock photo somewhere um, that they can't really get the, an impression on how something looks. Uh, so don't be afraid of 3D printed stuff. And the reality is the only people that even notice 3D printed stuff is the people that are engineers. And then they know the, how the whole process works anyways. So really, just you know, I would focus on getting that imagery in front of people as soon as you can from a media standpoint. So a few final thoughts. Um, kind of the five most important things to me um, when it comes to a, a product uh, release is access to the product, as I mentioned. I don't do stock and PR photos. So if I don't have photos of a product, I generally won't post about it. Um, it's really that simple. Uh, time to actually use the product. Uh, I don't need you know, a month or a year for just a quick hands-on uh, look. I just need to be able to use it and, and try it out and um, even understand how it works at a very basic level. The product actually does what it's supposed to do. So if you're checking off the box of how to get a good review, if you've claimed one thing on your literature on your site and it doesn't do that thing, that's a bad spot to be in. Um, it needs to do what it says it's going to do. Um, you also need to have, or sorry, from my standpoint, um, I want to have a post out there for the second that you launch your product. Not a minute later, not an hour later, not two days later. Um, if it's you know, a day later, it's old news to the internet. Um, so it's less likely that you're going to get attention from me because it's considered old news. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then fast answers to clarifying questions. If I can't get answers to something, then it's really hard for me to write about it. I will hold posts if I don't have answers to questions um, because I'm not going to put something out that's incomplete or that I'm not clear on. Uh, so you know, if, if I have to wait an extra day, then your, your post waits an extra day. Um, most importantly, your, the legacy of your product on the internet is based on your launch day. Hands down, all of the information you'll be able to find about your product for years to come will be written on the day you've launched your product. Um, probably the greatest example of that in all sports technology time is the Moto Active. Uh, the Moto Active launched initially, and there was a lot of, a lot of hubbub about it. The problem was that they had, not a problem, but they had seeded people with early units. And when those people went to talk about it, they talked about battery life that was one tenth of what the unit had claimed. Um, and they talked about issues with uh, the display and things like that. Um, all those things were fixed within about a month and a half, but nobody ever rewrote about it again. Right? They simply wrote about how the battery life was an hour and the display sucked and this and that. Um, went on to be a, a great little unit, but everything you ever find about Moto Active was in the first week of release. And that was one of the reasons why that product um, was ultimately killed, is that it just simply had too much bad press about it um, that sat around too long. So with that, I'm happy to take any, any questions. I don't know if we have any time, maybe. Uh, uh, well, we have uh, just a, an open, open schedule after this, so feel free. Huh, cool. I'm sure there's piles of questions. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? <laughs> No one's wanting to speak in no front of competitors. That's what <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame you. Okay, Ray. Perfect. Thank you, so thank you very much. I appreciate your, it. Yep. Your, your insights and uh, uh, the gift. Uh, thank you. You maybe give this to the girl. Okay. <laughs> it's not for the girl, but you didn't mention her. You did put her on there. I did brief mention, yep. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Again, thank, thank you. you. Yep.